great girlfriends, get ready for the 2018 Doers and Disruptors Conference in New York City. This year's conference is dedicated to igniting great girlfriends, putting your ideas into motion, and moving the needle to get the results that you desire out of life. Join us June 21st and 22nd in New York City for a two-day event with brilliant doers and disruptors across various industries who started with an idea and blossomed to become change agents, global influencers, and enterprise leaders. At the conference, you'll gather for workshops, panels, connect groups, dance breaks, light bites, and more while getting tips and resources to fulfill your passion in your personal life, your career, your business, motherhood, relationships, and more. Don't miss this opportunity to join forces with women who are on the same mission as you and experience the excitement and impact that only Brandis and I can bring to life. Get your tickets now at thegreatgirlfriendsconference.com. We'll see you there. This episode of the Great Girlfriends podcast is recorded in Mount Media Studios in NYC, which is powered by Sennheiser, the future in audio. Check them out at mouthmedianetwork.com. Welcome to the Great Girlfriends Podcast, where we discuss life, love, laughter, and everything in between. We're your hosts. I'm Sybil Amuti. And I'm Brandis Stanio. And before we jump into this week's episode of the podcast, make sure you sign up for our newsletter at thegreatgirlfriends.com. And don't forget to leave us an amazing iTunes review. Yes, that is the payment for listening to this podcast. (laughs) I love it. Five stars all the way. Let's do it. Let's do it. Hi, great girlfriends. So I am so excited because Sybil and I have a guest today. But before we even get into our guest, I have to tell you. So Sybil met me at Starbucks before we came in to record. (laughs) And she came in with... Oh, by the way, great girlfriends, I'm doing no carbs right now. Okay, <laughs> let me let me just start with that. I'm doing no carbs. Oh my gosh! And Sybil walks in with a bag from Magnolia's Bakery, which 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 was, which was the first problem. But then she also walked in with a card and some beautiful flowers. Aww. So thank you so much, Sam. You're welcome, my kids. <laughs> So this is hilarious. My kids were like, what's a carb? What's not a carb? Because I explained that you weren't eating carbs. So Dylan and Sam had a whole disagreement. Is cheesecake a carb? No, it's cheese. No, it's a carb. I think it's like a cake. Well, let's Google it. So they Googled and they were like, it doesn't say if it's a carb. Just don't get her regular cake. Well, maybe she could just have it for her birthday. So we opted to just get you the cheesecake and then... I was like, she'll just have it one day, and then she'll she'll figure and it out later. So good! Oh my goodness! I just like our our amazing guest that we have in right now. She caught me eating it as she was walking in because it's so yummy. Oh it's my so goodness! Yummy. So Yay. thank you, Sam. Thank you. Oh, happy happy belated belated belated. Her birthday passed. It's a great girlfriends um, in in March, and she was out on the beach getting a tan while. Uh, the rest of us were out here in the cold in New York. So. And Sybil, Sybil, you're getting ready for 40, girl. I am approaching you're about 40. To, you're about to come to the club. I'm come on, on in into to the, the club. club. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Girl, the water is warm. The sun is shining. Is it? Yeah, it's okay. good. It's good. I don't know. I mean, you know, last year when I was like, I'm turning 40 next year, I was like, eh. I'm telling the closer you. closer I get, I'm like, oh, crap, I'm turning 40. No, the oh, water, no, the water is warm. The sun is shining. The birds are chirping. Okay. It's good. Okay. Well, that's another episode of me turning 40. Uh, today, we have an amazing great girlfriend. Just go ahead and get your pen and paper because you, you're going to want to take a thousand notes when you hear what our guest girlfriend, Minda Hartz, from the Weekly Memo has to say about life and entrepreneurship and uh, women and culture and everything that we're going to share today. So welcome, Minda. Welcome. Hey. Glad to be here. Happy belated birthday. Thank and you. Happy early birthday. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Minda um, was introduced to us by our great girlfriend, Tiffany Dufu. So shout out to Tiffany Dufu. I She'll be happy we're having this moment yes, today. thanks, Tiffany. Tiffany yeah. taught us all to drop the ball. Tiffany set myself free. She might have set me too free. <laughs> Tiffany, she really did set, set you too free. <laughs> Tiffany, I don't know if you'll agree with the way that Brandis is dropping her ball. Tiffany, you may have set me too free. Thank God we had to clean the lady come because I was like, laundry? I was like, Tiffany said it's okay for this laundry she to be right here. She always does this. 
Well, Tiffany said we have to learn to drop the ball. So I'm dropping this ball. Every time I think about dropping anything, I said, well, I think Tiffany would approve of it. <laughs> <laughs> so girlfriends if you haven't checked out Tiffany Dufu's book Drop the Ball it was really good and it basically gives us the permission to just put things down sometimes Absolutely. Not, we don't have to attend to everything at once right and all the time but learning when to drop and put things down so that that was and then go back and listen to Tiffany's episode because Tiffany is fantastic and she is just a great connector and she yes. led me to Minda's loving arms and we had a great <laughs> meetup at the wing where we learned about you Minda yes so for our girlfriends just share who you are first. We'd love to know who is Minda. Yeah, Minda. Well, I'm a Southern California girl. I grew up outside of Los Angeles. And then when I was a teenager, my parents moved to Chicago and so um, spent time out there. And then after college, graduate school, uh, I went back to L.A. because I needed, I told my mom, I can't do these winters anymore. <laughs> I got to get back to, back to Los Angeles. And so uh, from there, I built my career as a fundraising consultant uh, at a firm. And so we worked with universities and colleges to help them build their endowment strategies so they can raise more money and help more students and build more buildings, all of that kind of stuff. And so uh, I spent the last 15 years as a consultant uh, in corporate America working with nonprofits. So that's kind of where my trajectory, I, I first generation college student and the oldest of three kids. And so for me, we had a household income of about $20,000 between both parents. And so it's easy to say we were in uh, we were poor. You know, mm -hmm. it's it's funny when you get older, you hate to like spit that out of your mouth, but we were, for lack of a better word. And so for me, I was really driven by by money because mm -hmm. we had such a lack of it. And so I'm like, you know what? The Cosby Show. They have degrees. They have. <laughs> this must be how you get the coin. You know, you go to school first. And so that's what drove me uh, mm -hmm. to to corporate America to to their. Um, loving arms, if you will. And so, and from that, I found uh, a degree of success and was able to help my family out and, and others. So, um, so it's interesting to, to talk about being an entrepreneur today, because if you would have asked me a few years ago, I never would have left that table because it was a consistent paycheck and et cetera, et cetera. So um, it's interesting where life will take you if you let it. So Absolutely. how in the world did you get to cold New York? <laughs> <laughs> you left cold Chicago. <laughs> right. Yes. Um, I didn't think I was going to be back in cold weather only to visit or see shows, right? <laughs> and so, uh, um, but my previous job, they said, oh, we need you to go out to New York and work on a client. And from there, I was working out of New York in, in North Carolina, going back and forth. And that was the moment in time where I started to it's interesting. So I mentioned that, you know, growing up poor, I, my head was down. I just went into corporate America. I started just doing my work and, and I figured out there's a way that a game is played and you, you move through the, through the corporate America uh, pipeline. And so uh, it was around the Trayvon Martin time period. And I just had this awakening in my spirit where I wanted to do something more for our community. Mm -hmm. And what could I do as being the only black woman in my firm for 15 years? There was never any others. And so I'm it gets lonely. Uh-oh, hold on. <laughs> I'm <laughs> sitting <laughs> over here. My, I'm, my, my brows are up. I'm like, what? Yeah. For 15 years? 15 years. Yep. You got to be kidding me. It was like that Beyonce song, just me, myself, and I. That's all I got. <laughs> wow. What an awkward 15 year run of Black History Month. Yeah. <laughs> like, they're like, yeah. so Minda, do we need to celebrate this year or what do we do? Yeah, we weren't they're, even celebrating. You know, that's how like, just far removed are people. <laughs> are you, I mean, are, you got to be kidding me. I wish that I was. And, and at that point in time, I just thought it was normal because mm -hmm. you're in this space and you see no one else that looks like you and you just kind of make it work. And so, What city was this in? I'm sorry. This was, uh, well, my firm was out of Los Angeles, okay. but uh, I was in bananas. New York and North Carolina on projects because we were on-site consultants. And so from there, I just realized, you know what? This is not okay. And there has to be somebody advocating for women of color. And I felt like after Lean In came out, it was a great conversational topic about women leading in in the workforce, but I didn't mm -hmm. always feel like it was talking to me, mm -hmm. you know? So, mm -hmm. um, as women of color, we read all of the materials and we see the statistics and, and oftentimes we're missed out of that conversation. We're just completely invisible. And so I decided, you know what, enough is enough. Um, I wanted to create a platform that would highlight the 
women of color that are out there killing it, just like the Sheryl Sandbergs, because we know, and you guys have had them on your show, you know they're out there. Mm-hmm. We just don't always know they exist. And so, um, and also highlighting their achievements, but also giving tools for um, the women of color on our platform to have the tools they need to succeed in the workplace. Because sometimes you don't get the manual and you don't know what you're supposed to do when you walk in Mm -hmm. to the door. Wow. So you, how did you transition or how did you know when it was the right time to transition into entrepreneurship? Yeah. You know, (laughs) because I think I had that I knew what scarcity felt like, and so uh, many of my friends that I saw leap into entrepreneurship, they would leave without having a safety net. And so Mm -hmm. for two years, I worked my corporate job while I built the memo. And so it was hard, sleepless nights, a lot of nights and weekends, but I built a safety net for myself so that I wouldn't have to rely on anyone else to fund my company uh, at the time. So I, I had a couple years worth of runway so that I could build it the way that I wanted and help as many people as we possibly could without being um, without having to rely on somebody else telling me how to build the company. Yeah. So, uh, so for me, it was just setting myself up for success. And I think oftentimes as entrepreneurs, it's already stressful building a company. And then when you have to find funding, that just makes it adds another layer. Mm-hmm. So um, I wanted to be my own superhero. <laughs> wow. Yeah. So when you did decide, all right, I'm stepping out, I'm prepared. What was the mission? Yeah, you know, it's funny because when I first started, um, I started small. I think that's something that entrepreneurs, um, sometimes you feel like you have to, there's this race and you have to get to the finish line as fast as you can. And I started just with a blog, which is the Monday memo that comes out every week. I did that for about six months just to build traction and build the email list. And then uh, about a six or seven months later, then we launched our first career boot camp, which is our signature product. And we have salary negotiation, a career transition, all of the different things that we feel women need in their toolkits to be successful and prepare them for the table um, that they want to sit at. And so incrementally, we continue to grow uh, the memo. And I I have a co-founder. Her name is Lauren. Hey, Lauren. Hey, Lauren. (laughs) Hey, Lauren. (laughs) (laughs) So what made Lauren jump on board? Yeah, so I was running the memo maybe almost a year by myself, and during the time period, we're friends from Los Angeles, I kept telling her, Lauren, you're going to be my co-founder, you just don't know it yet, Mm -hmm. and over time, she started to see the vision, and she's like, you know what, there needs to be people out here talking about advocating for for women of color, and so I want to do this with you, and we've been rolling ever since. Wow. (laughs) Yeah. Okay, I have to ask that question, too, because there's this um, idea that women... It's hard to find women to partner with in business and that um, you have to kind of have this complete checklist. What made Lauren look like a suitable candidate for partnership for you? Well, we knew each other for a long time. And for me, um, I'm a very private person. So Mm -hmm. it was important that I had somebody um, who understood how I work and they understand kind of the... I, I am kind of a type A uh, personality, so mm-hmm. <laughs> but very you know warm, and so she knew how I worked on previous projects, and and also she understood the vision. She's a woman of color herself, and so she knew how it was being in a workforce, being isolated, and so we both connected on on that topic, and and just knowing that after we ran our first boot camp and we had 400 women of color come through our our first boot camps the summer of 2016 we both knew that we were on to something and Mm -hmm. and just to talk with those women and see that they just needed to know that it's okay what you're experiencing and, and just validation and here's some tools to help you move forward and access to a network. And, and when you see that every week or every time we run a boot camp, you know, your why every time. So if you question Mm -hmm. it ever, um, when you meet the women on our platform, you know that you're, we're headed in the right direction. I love it. How were you able to get 400 women to sign up for your boot camp? Yeah, um, a lot of prayer. <laughs> I mean, yeah. We didn't know that that would, was going to happen, but I, I live by this mantra of Audrey Lord is I, I'm deliberate and afraid of nothing. And so we went mm-hmm. out there and we just pounded the pavement. We actually handed out handbills. <laughs> we did uh, a lot of, um, you know, social media marketing. But mm-hmm. because I had started to build the subscription list months before, um, 
that was we had like a, a prime group of people who were already interested mm-hmm. in what we were doing and and I think relationships just like the great girlfriends when you build relationships authentic relationships uh, people will continue to support what you're doing mm-hmm. and um, so shout out to all the women that have supported us in some way shape or form I love it yeah wow so tell me what what have you learned that like completely scares you in terms of numbers and, and our representation what don't we know? I mean, I think we know it. We think we see it. Yeah. Like we, I would have never guessed that one in 15 years there'd be one woman in a company. So tell me more. What what else do we need to know? You, you know, I thought that there, you know, so I will say this. Being a woman, the only woman of color in my firm, I was surprised um, to find out that there were others in a similar situation. Mm-hmm. Um, and a lot of the women that come to our career boot camps, they share their stories of being the only one and also thinking that you're crazy because you don't have anybody to talk to yeah. about the biases or the microaggressions and people that you might mm. think were your advocates somehow turn out not to be your advocates. And so how do you navigate workplace politics? And I think that was the thing that I thought a lot of women knew how to do. Uh, but I I found that a lot of women haven't been exposed to be able to navigate that properly and Mm -hmm. so I think that's one of the main things that we're always talking about is how to navigate those and whether you're you know a woman of color or not there's still um a a route to to figure out how to navigate those politics and and we don't always know and sometimes Mm -hmm. the the route that we think is the right one we find out that it's not and so um one of the things I love about the memo is even though we're for women of color built by women of color we have some great allies that come out to our boot camps and support what we're doing because I think when you talk about intersectionality you need everyone at the table yeah and so um yeah and I think it's just securing the seat I think giving people the tools they need and and we're not sitting around talking about the man or (laughs) this Mm -hmm. other person this is investing in yourself and I I was also surprised to find that there weren't uh, a lot of women that were investing in themselves or knew that they could and so I think it's more of um you know, selling a little bit of inspiration to and, mm-hmm. and access to what the table could look like if you want to be there. And also reminding women that if this is not the table for you, it's okay to walk away mm-hmm. and find one that's, that's best for you and having those conversations with ourself. Mm. So I, f- I hear like a great sense of responsibility, one woman to another. And um, it sounds like that's sort of been the foundation for the platform that you guys have built and what is your hope that, you know, women who experience the boot camp, I would like to know a little peek of like what takes place within the boot camp. And then when they go, you know, when they're uh, when they've graduated or they've completed the boot camp, what is the expectation that they will do in their workplace or in their community for the next woman? Yeah, um, I'm glad you brought that up because one of our uh, core uh I guess one of our core beliefs at the memo is that generosity. So you don't get to the table without bringing someone else there as well. Mm -hmm. And so we always encourage women when they come to boot camp, if you enjoyed it and you like it, tell your girlfriend about it because we want her to have the resources Mm -hmm. just the same. And so uh, when I started the business, I wasn't, I just wanted to help people, right? I wanted to help women that look like me, but I didn't realize how <clears throat> how important that responsibility was until I actually entered the space. And so when we first started, we started with the individual boot camps. And now we've, um, thank God, we've grown into what we call a digital subscription. And that means that every month, it's almost like your your beauty box that you get, mm-hmm. uh, at, you know, with your lipsticks or your um hair products, but it's career development tools. So each month you get tools to your inbox that are correlate with what you say you need help with in the career. So when you first log on, you, if you want memo in a box is what we call it, um, say salary negotiation, you want to ask your boss in the next six to 10 months for more. So every month you'll receive digital career tools that help you move toward that goal to be able to ask. Mm -hmm via webinar, private Slack, things of that sort. And then we have accountability partners that are checking on you to make sure that you're moving through the process. And then we have a networking group where you can come together and talk about what, with other women uh, in similar uh, industry or others that are interested in just being a partner uh, and helping you out. Or uh, if there's a new job and you say, hey, I'm, I'm looking to get into this industry, so we have tools um, 
that jobs actually come to us and say, we're looking for diverse candidates. We know that you have X amount of women on your platform. And so there's a lot of different ways that women use us. And some, uh, they don't do the subscription, but they just, it's almost like uh, the concealer. They just put it on when they need it. So they, <laughs> so they come and they, they buy an individual boot camp, you know, when it's, when it's necessary for them. But my hope is that at the end of the day, the memo played some role in helping more women of color obtain a seat at the table because we know that um, we have a wage gap and that's women make white women make 78 cents on a dollar, but women of color make much less Mm -hmm. anywhere from 40 to 68 cents on a dollar. So we have that. And then the executive roles in C-suite positions is less than uh, 3% and boardrooms less than five. So we have a lot of work to do. And so I hope that when I look back on it all, that many women will say, you know, I'm glad that I had the resources at the memo to help us prepare for our seat because sometimes we want a seat so bad. And once we get there, we're not really sure what we're supposed to do. But Mm -hmm. if you're prepared when you sit down, then it it alleviates some of that imposter syndrome, I feel. Yeah. Let's get into the nitty gritty. (laughs) So what are some like things that women don't know? Like give us some of the tools that you guys share. Like what are some of the things that you wish every woman knew when they wanted to get promoted like some very practical things you know it's 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 hard to answer that question because sometimes I walk into a room and we're doing a boot camp and the things that I assume that most women know uh, they may not know or things that I assume they don't they may know and so everybody falls um, at different career points uh, so that you learn different things. But one thing I think across the board that I'm finding a lot of women um, may not be aware of is this whole sponsorship versus mentorship. And so having mentors are great. People who give you advice, um, they can work in your office, they can be your mom, they can be your pastor, uh, anyone who's providing advice. But a sponsor is someone who will open that door and create new opportunities for you within your organization. Or um, if you're a public speaker, then they'll open up that door and bring you in and put you on the stage. So a champion. And I think that many of us can find mentors, but we don't always have a champion inside of the workplace. And I think when you think about workplace politics, a lot of moves happen. I say after six, uh, a lot of things happen. But when you have the right connections. And so Mm -hmm. if you are not there after six or you're not at the, you know, happy hour at the birthday party or you don't learn that Bob likes red velvet cupcakes, you know, you may miss out. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Right. And Mm -hmm. Becky, she may squeeze into that spot because you just weren't there at the right times and you didn't know how to how to play that game. And so um, in my own experience, how I did get to the table is because I had a sponsor. I had tons of mentors in the workplace, but and they gave me good information on how to dress for success, all of that stuff. But um, this gentleman, Steve, he's the one that opened the door for me. He's the one that said, Minda, I want you in this room. You know, you need to be making more money. And he had the ability because he was in executive leadership to be able to do that. And so I think in order to change the game, we need to create an alliance, a workplace alliance, uh, and have those people on your team from HR to your supervisor to the receptionist, you know, everybody has to be on your team and and you are the point. So navigating how to make that work for you so that at the end of the day, when you're not in the room, you have people advocating for you. And I Mm -hmm. think that that's one of the things that I'm finding that um, building that alliance is something that some women have a hard time doing. Let's take a commercial break and jump right back in. Great girlfriends, do you have your ticket to the 2018 Doers and Disruptors Conference? If not, what are you waiting for? Join us in New York for a two-day event filled with brilliant doers and disruptors across various industries who started with an idea and blossomed to become great change agents. We can't wait to join with you for workshops, panels, connect groups, dance breaks, light bites, and more while giving you tips and resources to fulfill your passion in your personal lives, careers, businesses, motherhood, and relationships. Log on to thegreatgirlfriendsconference.com and get a ticket for yourself and your greatest girlfriends. We'll see you there. And you mentioned going to the birthday parties, yeah. mm-hmm. going to the after work things, which sometimes we don't like to do. We don't, right? right? Now that's something um, I have found that a lot of women say, "I don't want to, I don't want to do that." And I say, you know, well, there's two roads, right? <laughs> you can go down the the happy hour or after six road. You don't have to drink. You can have seltzer water, um, mm-hmm. or you can sit in your cube and 
wonder what's but, happening. Yeah, I wonder what's going on. <laughs> right. Because you I mean, are on the outside. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, it's up to you. You you are the curator of your career. You have decisions you can make. But if you say you want that seat, there are mm-hmm. certain things you're going to have to do within um, reason to get mm-hmm. there. And the birthday parties and the afterward. I, have, I had an old assistant who told me, Brandis, after five, I'm done. She's like, I'm not going. And I was like, but this is our boss's baby shower. Like, there's an invitation. (laughs) There's an invitation. (laughs) And an obligation. But (laughs) there's not really an option not to do this. You know, and I remember saying, I just don't want to do it. I don't feel like I need to do that in order to be promoted. So for that woman who's saying that, because there's a great girlfriend, listen to this podcast right now, and she's saying... I got other responsibilities. I have children. I don't want to go to the bowling alley. I don't want to go to the after. I don't want to go to their housewarming. I don't want to go to their birthday party. I don't even want to see them at work. So, you know, I I tolerate them at work and I'm fine. I can be friendly with them at work, but I'm not interested in doing the after work stuff. What's your, what's your answer to that, Mindy? <laughs> I would be like that meme, girl, bye. I mean, it's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's you have the choice. Again, right. I, I'm not here to say, to force you to go to the, the happy hours or the barbecues, but I'm telling you, things happen at those places. Yeah. The things yeah. that you don't get to hear about at the water cooler are happening yeah. there. And Absolutely. so if you want to be a part of the magic, you got to get out of that cube. You got to make your face known because the reality is no one's coming to tap you on the shoulder at your cube. Few and far between and be like, hey, we see you're doing great work. You know, we want to get mm-hmm. to know you. No, you got to get out and get to know them because yeah. they're not going to take that time uh, more times than not to get to know you. So if you don't want to do it, Becky or Keisha, she'll be glad to tell you how it went. <laughs> I love you. Right, right. right. Keisha. And what if you're not being invited? So do you suggest that women initiate some of these outings? If like if, if you're the things are happening, and you're like, dang, I just heard they went out, but nobody invited me. Yeah, that's a thing, too, being invited, right? Um, I think it starts, you can start small. And if you are the one that never goes out to lunch, even with your coworkers, Mm -hmm. start doing that. that. (laughs) Start there. You don't even have to go out after six all the time, but let people get to know you outside Mm -hmm. of just that nine to five. Um, That was one of the things I think early in my career, I thought, let me just do my work, keep my head down, and all these things will come because people will see that, oh, she's working. She's coming in early, but nobody gave a no. darn about that stuff. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I right. mean, they did, right? But I had to get up out of my seat. I had to make myself known. I had Absolutely. to make sure my face was you know, seen in certain spaces. And then eventually, uh, I was invited to certain things. But, um, you know, there's, <laughs> there's those workplace politics. You know, in my office, there was a woman who, she was the president of our company at the time, and she... Um, didn't like women to wear open toe shoes. That mm-hmm. was her thing. Like, hated it, <laughs> hated it. Um, when she saw it, and being in LA, it could be a hundred and some degrees, and she did not want to see you in any kind of sandal. And so women would show up with their open toe shoes, be like, this is what it is. And I was one of the only ones at in that location that would never wear my shoes or my toes open. And rather I was doing good work or not, she asked me to come out to lunch with her and promoted me in different ways. And I I don't know if it's because of the shoes, but that was part of workplace politics. Mm -hmm. And I think we have to be aware, acutely aware of what's going on around us. And that takes us getting out of our seat and Mm -hmm. finding out what's what. Yeah, I can remember. uh, It just reminds me back in one of my very first jobs. I I was in a um, I was in a place where I was one of a few minorities that worked there, but I was definitely only female. And I remember the guys would all say, we're going out to have a beer. Do you want to go? out and have a beer they would offer to go out and have a beer and I had to drink beer so I would say no not understanding like she said that I could have had seltzer that I could have gone out and just had a soda or I could have just gone out for good company but uh, there was a light bulb that went off I told one of my mentors about it and she was like what they're offering you is relationship and they're not necessarily saying have beer they're saying would you like to spend time with us and over time what I realized is that um, every pro- professional relationship is with a person so there's a personal relationship that's happening in professional arenas and we tend to forget 
that these are people that are humans. Like you said, they got a birthday. Go say happy birthday at the conference. Go in the conference room, eat the cupcake, and sing the song, and then get five, back five to your minutes, email. Right? Yeah, because there are some people who will not who will go not to the go. conference room for we'll the cake. Sit there and be like, they're like, I got too much work this. to do. Go your boss's get... cupcakes. The... If the whole department is on break, you go go celebrate your boss for five minutes, eat the cupcake, and sit back down and do your emails. Or you know what I'm saying? Go go stand by the cooler and just have a little water. I know you got your own water, but go listen and build rapport with somebody. Go say hello. Go yep. recognize them. Like that kind of thing. I think sometimes we do forget that these are people. So these yeah. are personal relationships built in a professional arena. Yep. Ultimately, you're playing the people game. And it's like That's what, it. what I'm hearing you say, because part of me was like, bump her. She doesn't get to tell me that I have to wear closed toe shoes. Who does she think she is? That's that's that Memphis in me. But then the other part of me <laughs> that knows the professional politics says, what difference does it make? Like, honestly, if I get to build rapport with someone who I can then later change her mind about shoes, mm-hmm. maybe Minda will have the opportunity to teach her something different. Because when you build rapport, you do have to create an exchange. And what difference does it make? Go ahead and, and do the things that um, will sometimes shift the relationship, then you can get advantage. Then you can start influencing. But I think what one word you used earlier brings me back, the microaggression um, that takes place sometimes with people um, who tend to come off as passive aggressive and will tend to say that we're macro aggressive as black women in our approach, that we're volatile mm-hmm. sometimes, sensitive and angry, words that are used to describe us in the workplace. Um, that sometimes we need to be able to change that that narrative, and that's the way that we do it, and how we pick our battles. Absolutely, and you picked a different battle. I'm like, I'm okay with this uh, close toe shoe. Yeah, thing. It's not, right. that's yeah. not the battle I want to work toward. And because there were no women of color in the room, if that's what it took, I would have wore a hundred yeah. times over. And I think to your what we're both talking about is relationship building. Oftentimes we put a lot of emphasis on your external network, you know, go into the meetups, go into this networking function, but inside the workplace, if that's where you want to be and you want Mm -hmm. to grow, you need to invest internally in the people who can make that thing happen. And I don't think we focus enough on the internal relationships Mm -hmm. within our, our companies. I I totally agree. Minda, do you think that sometimes we create our own, um, I'm trying not to say sell. We 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 create our own box, right? Do you find that sometimes we've, for whatever reason, decided that we're not supposed to talk to the VP or the president or or the CEO, and so because we've decided that in our own minds that that was off limits, that we limit ourselves. Mm-hmm. Like, what do you what do you find in in that space in terms of like how we? relate in the workspace to people who we perceive higher than us. No, I think you hit it on the head. I think I often say, don't be ambivalent about your career. Like if there's people that you want to meet or talk to, they need to know who you are because you can't assume I use Bob. I'm picking on Bob. You can't assume that Bob knows every move you want to make within the company Uh or even knows what you're doing because sometimes there's all these other layers before you get to Bob. And so I think we do ourselves a disservice when we sit in our own feelings and say, oh, well, they don't want to talk to me or they looked at me a certain kind of way. Until you vocalize what it is you want out of your career within that company, once you've done that, then you can navigate if, if this is a microaggression or not. But if you never say anything to anyone and you're just like, oh, why haven't they given me this? But oftentimes some people aren't even thinking. Unfortunately, they're not even thinking about you. So they're not thinking about where to mm-hmm. put you. But you have to. Being our own advocate, we have to make sure that everything is clear, that nothing is convoluted, and that um, and that they're not mind readers at the end of the day. <laughs> so, yeah. And I think once we get out of our box and, and do that and have those kind of conversations, then we can deal with some of the other stuff. Um, but I think what I'm finding, at least at, on our platform, is a lot of women are just not advocating for themselves and making it known what they want out of their career. So I think it does start with us and then from there we can figure out what the rest ne- what rest needs to happen. So is there like a system we should have for lunch? Like do you <laughs> say like once a week go have lunch with someone who's in a position higher than you or like do you give women advice on kind of how to navigate the lunch situation because that's another time when I just want to go in my car and, and listen to Anita Baker. Yes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> or I can't stand my coworkers, let alone trying to have lunch uh, with yeah. them. Like, yeah. I, I think that's real because um, 
in my former life, I traveled maybe 90% of the time on the road. And so you'd be at the client site all day. And then if you were traveling together, everyone want to hang out at the at the hotel bar or lobby. Mm-hmm. And, and that was the last thing I felt like doing <laughs> every day. Mm-hmm. Like, I really, we're really not friends, but, you know, you, you try to make that. And so I would still force myself in those situations. So, or I would be the one to initiate at lunch because I'm the same way. Let me relax. Let me go sit, sit away somewhere and collect my bearings. But I would ask my colleagues if they wanted to go out to lunch. Not every month or even every other month. I just wanted to have some rapport because, again, you want people to advocate for you when you're not in the room. If they don't know you, they can't advocate for you. And so I think Issa Rae said it best. Sometimes we want to latch on to the, the, the big person first, but sometimes you have to put your anchor in um, across your peers that sit on the left and the right of you and get to know them first so that those people have buy-in. And then from there, you start building out what I call a bench because you need various players you know everybody adds value so from the ceo to the janitor you know get to know everybody and um you know if if your it if your computer goes down if you have a relationship with it something that could take five days can now happen in an hour (laughs) we've all seen that yes Mm -hmm. so something you said just struck me so somebody's saying well people know me they know my work They see me in in, in meetings. They know that I know my stuff, that it's together, that I'm performing well. What else do they need to know about me? I think it goes back to the relationship building. It... People who have fun with you see that you can smile and laugh at a joke or two, even if it's not that funny. They just want to get to know you outside of that. And I'll even put that on myself, too, because I thought, oh, well, these people see me every day. (laughs) How can they not know Mm -hmm. me? And one of my work mentors, she said, you know what, Minda, you got to let go a little bit. You got to let people see you have a fun side, but when you come in, you're very much business all the time, you Mm -hmm. know. So let them see that other side of you. And I'm like, well, you know, in my head, I'm like, what does that matter, you know, if I'm Mm -hmm. watching whatever the show was, you know, and talking about it at the water cooler. But once I started (laughs) to look at it differently, it was a relationship thing. These people just want to, they want to get to know me. They want to know where I come mm-hmm. from. What Do I like Sour Patch Kids? You know, those are the yeah. things that people want to know. Mm-hmm. And far be it for me uh, to, to deprive them of those things. You yeah. know? And the thing is, we can create the Brandis or the Menda or the Sybil that we want people to know. Mm-hmm. They don't have to know all of your like private personal business. Yes, there are levels. You can. There's levels to this, <laughs> and you can. And 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 people are actually fine with you know giving A them this nibble. very. They just need. What's they your just favorite need candy? Something. You know. <laughs> something and hold on to something that's I, personal. I, you know, I love this conversation so much because I know someone in my life who I have tried to drill this into for years. And they are just holding on, but they haven't been being promoted. Mm. And um, but they're smart, brilliant. I mean, you know, catch on quickly. Um, an amazing person, but people don't get to get a chance to see the, that amazing person. Mm-hmm. So I just I think that this is going to set some great girlfriends free. It's so true. I hope. I love what you're saying, Brandon. Because when you th- I think about times when I was in a position to hire. And um, and I would be hiring um, people for different suites, right? At different levels in a company, specifically one company, Bed Bath & Beyond, when I was there. I know who was in the suite. I know who the players were. I know who was going to be there five years, 10 years, another 15 years. I knew who was there. And I knew who, if they were groomed properly, would plug right appropriately into that team. Um, I knew who came and showed me more interest in in uh, longevity with the company. I knew who was just there for a check. I knew who was there uh, because they wanted to learn more about the company. I knew all the different people. And so as someone who was in a position to promote people, I was very conscious of the fact if I put Minda on a team with Brandis and Sybil, they have the potential to take this team you know, to the moon and back. Or if I put Brandis on a team with, with Sybil and Minda, you know, Brandis is only here for five years. Brandis has, is an entrepreneurial mind. Brandis is here to get certain things from this company, and then she's going to launch her own thing. So I'm not going to see sweetheart necessarily because I already know she's not here for the long haul. And so sometimes um, we have to be you know, mindful of what we're projecting in the workplace. Are we invested? And part of that investment is, is being relatable, is making connections, because if I'm on... A certain team, and I know that you know 
uh, uh, Leslie is knocking at the door and Leslie wants an opportunity to play on our team, well, I have to know she's a fit for our team. I don't care how talented she is. I don't care how brilliant she could be her son up, son down. If she's not compatible with the team and cannot meet the outcomes that are going to help influence the larger mission of the company, then she's not going to get a seat at the table. Plain and simple. And it doesn't, it doesn't matter across race. Now, what happens with our homegirls, <laughs> with our sisters, is sometimes we forget the fact that it's not always about race. Sometimes it is literally about relationship yes. and how much we really do understand the ability to make relationships outside of race. A lot of times in our workplace, many of us get so attached to race that we navigate towards affinity groups that are only mm-hmm. driven by race. And then when it comes time to have an affinity group with the tech girls, well, I'm in the black affinity group, so I'm good. Yeah, but the tech girls got a little more money funding tech because they have put more interest into the larger mission of the company versus just just the race. So I, I want us, as our women, I would hope that we can, through this conversation with Minda, raise our awareness that Sometimes it's not about not about race. Sometimes it's about relationship. Because what I'm hearing from you, Minda, also, um, I can say, dang, for 15 years, she was the only one. Or I can say, for 15 years, she managed to navigate through that company. She didn't go in the same door that she came. She didn't come, go out the same door she came in. She made progressions to her throughout her career there. So there were opportunity spaces. Can I say that your company didn't hire in because women were black? I don't know. Can I say maybe there were some people that weren't great fits? I can say that too. I don't know. But what I do know is that for the one that was there, you created a way, a space, a lane for others that could follow should they decide. But you also set up a standard for the people that were coming in. They had to learn how to build relationship. They had to want to have rapport. They had to you know, be outstanding in their work and their approach to work. And they had to play or participate in the politics knowing that there was a larger game at hand. You know what I mean? So I feel like um, sometimes we forget that, that we are setting standards as along as we go along the way. And we can either shut the door for people or open the door. I feel like you may have opened more doors than you shut. And I feel <laughs> I like so. some of us, they've put five locks on the door because we don't know how to act in the workplace. Yeah. And we're so caught in one card when it's, when it's not necessarily about that all the time. Sometimes it is about the relations, the things that you bring to the table. So, Absolutely. You know, yeah. I don't know. It's interesting because I do, I will say that there is, we have a plague in terms of, of, in terms of our representation in corporate, you know, our lack of representation. This is true. Um, I will say we have had a longstanding history in our country that has been tied to racism, which would then imply that that is associated with that. And we also see now entrepreneurs in in, uh, America, African-American women are leading the class. So there's more of us than there are any other class of women in entrepreneurship. So I see us setting up our own tables. But then I, I also wonder if we all set up our own tables, what happens on the other side of the table? That's the part I'm glad you brought up uh, because we all can't lean out. We can't all lean out. out. (laughs) Somebody got to play at the the big table. table. Yeah, Um, and I think often I'm so happy that our that our homegirls are starting businesses. I think it's great, and you know, some will even question, "Well, you left, you know, Mm -hmm. to do this," but it wasn't because I necessarily was unhappy. I just saw that my purpose started taking me a different way. But had I not created them I'd still be sitting yeah. at the table but with that said my thing is if I could help Lauren and I and the women who um, support us at the memo if we could help you figure out how to stay there or mm-hmm. move to another table that's better suited for you and not have to lean out at all this is great because yeah. sometimes you don't know what to do you don't know that you should be building relationships yeah. with the person sitting next to you or you don't know that you should go to the Saturday Hampton barbecue you know sometimes Mm -hmm. you don't know those things and so if we could give you some extra tools to help you navigate this maybe we will see more at the c-suite now it's not always that but i think a lot of times we have to figure out how to make it work because if we all lean out um then there's we really are going to see no more african americans in uh, fortune 500 Mm -hmm. companies as a ceo and i'd hate to think that ursula burns would be our last one (laughs) so so some of us have to stay and let me tell you as an entrepreneur 
there's other set of challenges that come. Oh, yes. Yes. Okay. Come on. So now that's not, the whole other show. You yes. know, that, that's the thing. So you might leave, but you might have to come back. So yeah. if you do keep those relationships up or uh, mm-hmm. hone in on those skills that you may need, like public speaking, that's one skill at the table that you'll always need in your toolkit. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, because when you sit at that table, you have to be able to advocate for you and the next one coming through the door. Yes, and absolutely. I find that that's a tool that some are, are scared of because if you can't advocate for yourself, it's hard to get to the table and you just are taking up space. Absolutely. 1,000%. <laughs> I, I, I love that. I was just thinking that, you know, one of the things that led me to Hamas was trying to get promoted. <laughs> I literally... You know I want this story. And I'm like, what is I it? I literally... <laughs> I had never had hummus in my life. I'm uh-huh. from Memphis. Uh-huh. I know about ribs, greens, uh, you right, know, right, soul food, soul, soul food. food. <laughs> and I was in a position I was not getting promoted. And I went and asked. I asked somebody. I want to know why I'm not being promoted. Like, mm-hmm. and not in a like I need to know why. It was I honestly wanted a real answer, and I got a real answer, mm-hmm. and it was from. A middle-aged, upper-management white woman who told me why I wasn't being promoted. I appreciate her to this day for that. And so I said, shucks, I need to go ahead and start, like, going to some of these after-work things. And you Is know, that what she told you? She didn't tell me that in so many words, but from what she told me, I knew they didn't know me. Okay. So she told me that I wasn't aggressive enough. And I said, that means they don't know me. Uh And so for me, I was like, I have to allow them to get to know me. Mm -hmm. And so that was kind of how I translated it. Mm -hmm. And so I said, I need to start going to some of these after work things so that they could really kind of get to know like who I am. And that led me to eating hummus, all flavors of hummus. (laughs) (laughs) House sitting at times. Uh You know, and doing things that I would have never done Mm -hmm. because I was on my own agenda. I was, you know, working at home in Memphis. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I had a life. I had my family. I had things I needed to do. Separate. I had my friends. (laughs) Mm -hmm. You know, so the people at work, like, why would I go and hang out with them on a Saturday morning when I can be, like, with my nephew or with my girlfriend? Like, you know, and so I really had to do a shift because... I was like, I want to I wanna be promoted. I want to be promoted. And so if being promoted means that I have to go have hummus, you know, four flavors of hummus, <laughs> then that's what I'll do. And I actually like hummus now. <laughs> four flavors of hummus. She because my old hummus. boss has six flavors of hummus on the table at every event. <laughs> Every event, and I'll never forget forget what hummus to bring. Now, right now, I know what hummus to bring. But red pepper hummus is my favorite. Yes, but then you know, I didn't know. I didn't even know what hummus was. I was like, "What is this?" She was like, "Hummus." I was like, "Well, what's what's hummus?" You know. <laughs> they want to see you eat hummus, okay. but but it was <laughs> like oh literally that. But it really was kind of um, it. It was a big shift for me. I was in my early twenties. No one. My mom was a teacher. My dad was a preacher. Nobody was there to tell me how do I navigate this corporate space. I had no idea. Yeah. So I had to figure it out for myself. Yeah, and the hope is that we help the next generation so that we they have less skin knees. <laughs> <laughs> and Sybil brings out a package of red pepper hummus. Red pepper hummus. Yes. I should have the When crackers. you said that, I just laughed hysterically because I was like, oh I'm, my God, did that become my New York snack? I don't know, but I carry I, I can guarantee you, were, you were not eating hummus in Memphis. Hey, Let me just tell you, you just weren't. I think I learned this at, at grad school. You and did. I, I love it though. So I, I, have, I have hummus and I'm proud of it. Amanda, <laughs> 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 M- Amanda, thank you so much because. Um, I think we have seen it through the great girlfriends. What we've yes. seen um, is a lot of our girlfriends will say this show has become like a midday escape for them and that they've they've had certain things reinforced personally because we're in their ear saying, girl, get back out there and get to work and get your job done and be responsible. But having you um, systematically attacking some of the things, because honestly, we, we go to college and we land at a job and 
we may ask our mom or our sisters, whatever, has this ever happened to you at your job? And then your sister, girl, you need to quit. Or, girl, yes, you need to go I say would not this. deal with Don't that. Don't take that from anybody. You know, and you get this street advice sometimes <laughs> <laughs> from people, you know, who love you dearly, mm-hmm. but they're protectors. Right. And then you, but your advocates and your sponsors, your, your sponsor will kick you out of her office and tell you to wipe your tears and get back at that computer. Right. Or, you know, but you have systematically set up a, a way for us to, ask the questions and I think for our great girlfriends listening it's a safe space because you don't feel like you can ask it at work all the time you don't want to seem like you're weak or inferior or um, that you don't have the knowledge but you do want to get the you want to get the insider scoop and that's what you guys are offering which is like you know a a sister advantage that I feel like some of us I wish I would have had I was hot headed in my 20s (laughs) and I needed somebody to be like seriously it's you know you're majoring in minors right now get out there focus on the big picture you know, get and, that seat. Yeah, and yeah. Get, get that seat, seat yeah. and don't forget that it's not just about you. And you know, my parents coming from the '60s have pounded that in my head. It is, this is you are always a part of moving a nation forward. You are changing. When you move, you're moving generations behind you. So don't forget because that's how they moved in that time, in that era. Our yeah. par- our parents are probably all in the same range. That's the kind of responsibility they had for what what. I think they have more of a consciousness of what they're doing. Now we're in a, a place in our nation where we can see we we can't just pretend it's about us. Mm-mm. Absolutely. Y- you know, not. this is yeah. not about us because yeah. our kids are having to walk out now to fight for, you know, gun control and our you know, we're still seeing our teenagers not being regarded. Our 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 black males are still struggling. We still don't have the right numbers where we are represented in um, corporate America and in government, and et cetera. So there's so much work to do. Absolutely. You know? And I even think if you start to see it as a game, right? Yeah. Like, you're going to be your authentic self, but at the end of the day, like, y- you want to get to the highest level in this situation. And if it takes you just speaking to someone, when sometimes it can be as a, I had a, my old boss was Pakistani. And I don't know if this has anything to do with it. Now, me and him, like, we adore each other. <laughs> mm-hmm. But when I first started, Amir would not speak to me when I first mm-hmm. started here in New York. Mm-hmm. I would literally go and say hello to him, and he would not respond. And for me, my objective then was get Amir to speak. <laughs> you know, and and we end up becoming, like, I finally cracked that nut, and, you know, we end up becoming really great friends through at, over time, but it was just, sometimes I think it's just as simple as not taking things personal. Yeah. Like, you know, what if I had spoke that one time and had never spoken again before mm-hmm. and after that because he didn't speak back? And there were people at my company who said, well, he, he didn't say anything to me, so I'm not saying anything to him. But then they stayed in the same position, mm-hmm. whereas I had been promoted literally like four times in two years. And it was just because people really, they knew I could do the job, but they also really knew me or felt like they knew me. Yeah. 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 I, yeah. I mean, we have to take the power into our own hands at, at some point. Mm-hmm. And um, again, you might come across, hey, being the only uh, black woman, <laughs> there were microaggressions. <laughs> there were hard days. Don't mm-hmm. you, <laughs> hey, don't let me paint that picture. It was hard. But I had the bigger picture in mind. Yeah. And that was... I wanted my coins, I wanted that seat, and I wanted <laughs> right. all these other yeah. things. But if I got mad on Tuesday because Bob said some stuff to me that hurt my feelings and walked out the door, or my dad, you want me to come up there? No, I don't want <laughs> you to come up there. <laughs> you know, I, I had to handle it a, a little more maturely. Uh, and so it's, you know, you have to just keep your eye on the prize. So yeah. my thing is I don't want us to leave. And if you are a great girlfriend, be a great girlfriend to another one in your mm-hmm. office. Yes. Don't leave her hanging. Don't leave her there to fight for herself you know let's really if you're an ally i'm rather you're black brown um yellow we can be advocates and great girlfriends to each other across Mm -hmm, the board i'd love to see that as we go into 2018 yeah absolutely and like we have great girlfriends of all races of all ethnicities um that listen to this podcast and so you know i love that 
we do have so many um, white women who listen to our podcast because they're able to hear both sides. Yep. And we, you know, we talk about everything and we don't ever shy away from race things. No, no. <laughs> yeah, but we love that we love that they listen and that they can hear this. And, that, and like, I love what you said, that it doesn't matter what race you are. You can be a great girlfriend to another yes. woman. Mm-hmm. Woman to woman right? to woman to yeah. woman to woman. Yeah, I yeah. love it. Yeah. So how can they find you? Find me on those nets. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm most active on Twitter, but across all handles, Minda Hearts, M I N D A H A R T S, and my weekly memo. Find us there, and um, my weekly memo. My weekly memo. Okay. Uh, you and subscribe to mm-hmm. our to our memo, and then also our career boot camps. And because you guys are such great girlfriends, if you put in the code the Great Girlfriends, you get a discount on any of our oh, pre-recorded oh, boot camps. Awesome. Yay. Thank you so much. That's awesome. <laughs> Thank yes. you. Amanda, you have dropped jewels. Yes. Thank you guys for having me. You everything. have dropped jewels. I believe that after this, we're going to have great girlfriends say I've been promoted because of that conversation. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I mean, because Minda, me and Sybil have told them some of these things, but they don't, they, they don't, they don't listen always us. listen to us. They don't listen to so. us. I feel like they hear from other people. <laughs> <laughs> they, just, they, just, they just use us to get to the other person. <laughs> so they use us to get to well, you today. Well, hopefully Minda, Minda they hear. Hopefully yeah. oh, yeah. they're hearing it from Minda. Right, right. They're hearing it from Minda, and they understand that it's a real deal. And and one day you'll be in, in uh, shoes where you or actually, I won't say one day. Now you're in a, a place where you can offer opportunity to someone else. It's not a one day. It's a now thing. Right? right, absolutely. So now, but Minda, thank you so much thank for your you time. Thank you so much. This thank is so great. Yay. We could not end this podcast without thanking our amazing husbands. Yes, thank you, Kwaku. And thank you so much, Rich Daniel. And our beautiful children. Thank you, Sam and Dylan. And thank you, Miss Sky Daniel. And thank you to all of you great girlfriends for trusting us as your go to source for everything life, love, and laughter. You can check us out on our social. On Instagram, The Great Girlfriends. On Twitter, The underscore Great GFS. And on Facebook, The Great Girlfriends. And please make sure that you join our Facebook group, which is over 16,000 women strong. Absolutely. And make sure you listen every single Wednesday on iTunes, Spotify, Podcast Bean, Podcast Republic, Google Play, and every other podcasting service. Absolutely. Be sure to post your questions, share with your friends, Keep Keep listening listening and and keep keep being being a great great girlfriend. girlfriend. I'm Sybil. And I'm Brandis. And we're signing off. Peace. Peace.